It's day 44 of our study through the uh, epistles of Peter, and we're glad you could join us this morning. We're going to be in 2 Peter chapter 3. We're going to be looking at verses 10 through 13 today, and we're going to look at, it opens up with a very uh, familiar phrase as you go through scripture. It's one that's used over and over again. We're going to be talking a little bit about the day of the Lord. And it says, he says in verse 10, it says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. The day of the Lord refers very specifically to the judgment of God. We're not talking about how uh, God will judge the works of, of those who uh, have accepted him as Savior. There's not the talk of, of how we're going to be rewarded for what we have done for Christ. That's not really what he means by the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is the judgment of the wicked. It is... God's final writing of all wrongs. It is, it, it's basically justice bringing day. God is laying down the hammer and saying, it is time, you have, you have done the crime, now here comes the punishment. And, and this is exactly what the day of the Lord is all about. And he says, and Peter says, it's going to come like a thief in the night. It's going to come quickly. It's going to come suddenly. You're not going to expect any of it. And you know what? Just like a thief... When it's all said and done, you're not going to like the result at the end. Because when you're looking at a thief coming and breaking into your home and stealing, you don't expect those things. You don't know when he's going to come. In fact, that's, that's kind of the whole point of being a thief. You, you want to go in and out without anybody even knowing that you were there until after it's all over. And when it's all done... The one, who pay, the one who pays the consequences is the person that got stole from. You know, they, they, they're the ones who have to deal with things being missing. There are bad consequences to that. You're not going to like it. And the day of the Lord, if you have never accepted Christ as your Savior, that day of the Lord is a day that is sure in coming. We've talked about that earlier on in chapter 3, that God's judgment is sure no matter whether it's past or future, it is guaranteed. It's coming that day of the Lord, and you best be you best fix yourself for it because that's coming at like a thief in the night. You are not going to know when it's going to come. So what you need to do at this very moment is repent. Get back to God. Go back into what we said in verse 9, that he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's what God really wants before the day of the Lord comes. He wants people to come to him and repent. But the day of the Lord will come. There will be people who will be judged for their wickedness, for their rejection of God. It's going to come. And in that day, it says, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with a fervent heat. We're talking about that, that fiery judgment that is to come. It's not the judgment of the flood this time. It's a fiery judgment. And both the earth and all the works that are, are, that are in it will be burned up. We looked at God creating things. And when God created, in the very beginning, he created a, a world, a, a universe that was not tainted with sin. He looked at it and he said it was very good. Everything he created was very good. And we live in a world that is not very good. We live in a world that has been scarred by sin. And there is, when you have something that was perfect that has been ruined, that has, you take this, this just take for example, you take a vase, and it's, it's, there's so much work and effort that's put into it, and it looks just absolutely beautiful. It is perfect. And you drop that vase. And it just shatters into millions of pieces. You can get all the glue and all, all of the, the adhesive and, and put the, the pieces of the puzzle back together. And it can be shaped back into a vase. But it certainly can never be perfect again. The universe that we currently live in, the one that is scarred by sin, 
can never be perfect again. It can, God can never look at it fully and say, this is very good. Sin has damaged it. With all the beauty that we see around us in all the world, it has still been damaged by sin. And therefore, God will completely remove all creation that has been ruined by sin. He's going he's to just get rid of it all, and he's going to start again. It says, therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be? He's talking to believers here. How, how ought you to act? You should be holy, or you should be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for the hastening and coming of the day of God. Peter here is saying that the end of the world, that the judgment of God, the thing that is so sure that we are all, that everybody uh, has, has this, this kind of day of reckoning coming their way. This, this day of the Lord, the thing that is so sure at the end of the last days, is so cataclysmic, it's so uh, extreme in its consequence. And our reaction to that, the way we live, and the way we live in light of what we've been saved from. We've been saved from the day of the Lord. Christ has taken us out of those kind of consequences because we have been saved from that. Christ took our place on the cross. He took our punishment on himself. He saved us from that. And how we should act... In light of the fact of what we've been saved from, the extremity of the consequences really should be, should lead us to an extreme change of life. We shouldn't be living the way we did before. We shouldn't be living as, as we fit in perfectly in a world that has been scarred by sin. We shouldn't fit in at all. We should uh, be in holy conduct. How we respond, how we act should be set apart from the world we live in. And it should be marked by godliness. That idea that everything that we do has been viewed through the lenses of Scripture. We are doing things God's way and not our way. Looking to the hastening of the coming of the day of God, because, which of, the, uh, because of the which uh, the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt away with fervent heat, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for the new heavens and the new earth in which righteousness dwells. See, we as believers, we are waiting for that new creation. We're even waiting for our new bodies. We're waiting for a time where we are free from the scars of sin. We're waiting for those moments, and what a day that will be. We should be anxiously awaiting that. But until then, until that moment, as, as much as we are anxiously looking forward to that, we should currently be living in holy conduct and godliness because of what God has saved us from. The day of the Lord is a day of extreme judgment. And what we've been saved from should lead us to living an extreme lifestyle. A lifestyle that is marked by following God. A, a lifestyle that is, is basically, we view the world around us, we view everything by the lenses of Scripture, by His Word, His truth. Not our opinions, not our feelings, not how we think things ought to be. We ought to be doing things God's way and only God's way. And that will set us apart from the world around us. That's going to set us apart from people who don't want anything to do with God. That's going to make us different. And what it may also do is it may show others Jesus Christ just by our holy conduct, by our, our godly living. It's going to show them that there is another way. There is a way that doesn't lead to the day of the Lord. It doesn't lead to that impending judgment. What it leads to is the salvation of Jesus Christ. It leads to a, a personal relationship with God for all eternity. That is what our conduct ought to lead people to. And 
as we anxiously await all these new things, we should live as people who are excited for those things. Right now, not for future hope, but right now we can say even in our current distresses, even in our current troubles, I've got something great waiting for me. And you know what? All the things I'm going through in this life is just but a short period of time. God has something greater in store for me, for not just my future, but for my eternity. He's got, he's got this in store for me for the rest of time, for the rest of, of, of my, my eternal life. I don't ever have to worry about all this. I am going to be living in a new creation. I am going to be a new creation. I am going to have this incorruptible body that is going to be so... It's not going to be held down by all the, the, the weights of, of my, my current physical problems. It's not, I, you know, I, I'm looking forward to the moment where I'm not dealing with headaches. I'm not dealing with, with muscle pains. I'm not dealing with all of the health issues that I've got. I'm never going to worry about getting a cold again. Those are, those are some amazing things to think on, and it really should change how we uh, respond to the world around us. And I hope what that does for you is it makes you a happier and more pleasant individual to deal with when you think that all the problems that you have in this world, they're only temporary. They will pass. And God has something greater for us, not just for the future, but for all eternity. I hope to see you next time as we finish up 2 Peter here. Uh, we're going to... Uh, just finish up chapter 3 and we'll be finished actually our study in the epistles. So I will catch you next time.